Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. All right, today we are doing something a little bit different. We have the wonderful Stephanie Prendergast, who is my co-host today, and we are speaking with Jason Kutch, who's an amazing researcher. He is a neuroscience researcher at USC. I first met Jason at IPPS, I think in 2016, and we connected on surfing. I had just moved back from Hawaii, so it was, of course, the first topic that came up, and we will get into a little bit about Jason's story and surfing and even research as this uh, fun new project is going on, but we connected and we started talking about different aspects of pelvic floor dysfunction, and Jason has his own sort of personal experience with that, but we are talking about his research, which is really focused on pain, the brain, and pelvic floor, muscle tone, and dysfunction. I brought on Stephanie because they have a much longer standing professional relationship, and I'm excited for her to share uh, her insights with Jason as well. So thank you for being on the show. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Great to see you both. Thanks for having us. Of course. Jason is an associate professor in the Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy at USC. He teaches neuroscience in the program as an associate professor, and he is the director of Applied Movement and Pain Laboratory at USC. He received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Princeton University in 2001, his PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Michigan in 2008, And his work is at the intersection of chronic pain and movement control. Particularly, he's interested in how the nervous system controls pelvic floor muscles, as well as how the brain dysfunction contributes to chronic pelvic pain and other chronic overlapping pain conditions, otherwise known as the COPC. His current research is focused on developing non-invasive brain stimulation approaches for augmenting chronic pain treatment. And right now there's a really amazing study going on with this involving surfing that I am so excited to also talk about. Steph, do you wanna talk a little bit about your relationship with Dr. Kutch? Yes, and again, we're talking about surfing. We're gonna be talking about endometriosis and pain. And it's just, for me, I feel very fortunate to have known Dr. Kutch as long as I have. We had a relationship with the International Public Pain Society which to give people a little bit of a historical perspective, um, back 20 years ago, pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic floor myalgia in women was not even something that was associated with some of the pain conditions. But as the years evolved, pelvic floor dysfunction became more important with myalgia. Then it was trigger points. Then came pudendal neuralgia. And a lot of these things were classified all under one umbrella which is not really appropriate, and we know that now. And forget about male pelvic pain. That wasn't even really being discussed, as we're probably going to get into today. But around 2010, 2011, we saw the emergence of pain science into clinical practice. And for me, this was novel, having practiced for 10 years with only peripheral physiologic changes. These diagnoses are associated endometriosis, interstitial cystitis, all the things that we're going to talk about today. But what really came into clinical practice in 2010 was that the brain also has a role in pain. So with Jason's research with neuroimaging and whatnot, what we're going to talk about today is how these changes in the brain, whether it came from pain or it's a cause of pain, have an effect on these conditions. And what's interesting about all of this is as researchers, as people in the field, we know that research is being dedicated to helping people suffer less but that's not yet what's happening in clinical practice. So we're hoping everyone comes away from today's interview with a little bit better of an understanding that improvement is on the way and hope that we know more about these conditions than we ever have before. And we owe a lot of that to Dr. Kutch's research. Yes. So I know that your research is not really on endometriosis per se. What's really important is that endometriosis, interstitial cystitis, and just even talking about pain in general and the brain is core to understanding and treating endometriosis. 
So your work is more in the urologic pain conditions. Can you talk a little bit about the MAP studies, what that is, where your research kind of started and developed into? I think that's really interesting. Yeah, no, um, I'll start with that. I'll start with a little bit of background about how I, I got interested in this uh, line of research. And then it nicely sort of overlaps in time with the start of the MAP study. And, uh, and I'll talk about some of the things that uh, we're learning now. So I was at the University of Michigan for my PhD from 2002 to 2008. And it was a really interesting time for me, both uh, personally and professionally, because across that period of time, while I was uh, really enjoying my graduate work, I seem to be over the, those years developing more and more of these chronic overlapping pain conditions myself. Uh, so it started in like 2003 with uh, migraine headaches and then in 2005 with uh, chronic low back pain. I took, I, I was a you know very active person and I, I took up um, cycling and, uh, and long distance cycling. And in uh, 2007, towards the end of my PhD, was the emergence in me of, of this chronic pelvic pain condition, uh, which I can only associate with some kind of combination of the, uh, the stresses of going through the end of the PhD together uh, with the um, physical stress of, of doing a lot of cycling. And that's something I really want to emphasize to your listeners uh, today is that, you know, even though I study the, the brain in chronic pain, um, that is no way uh, does that indicate that, you know, pain is all in your head. Uh, you know, pain is real, it's in the body, um, and then the, the brain plays a role in modifying the pain experience, uh, but that doesn't mean that the pain is uh, in any way coming from the head or, or limited to the head. So um, I, uh, I finished up my PhD, I was in a, a lot of pain. Of course, I stopped cycling, I, you know, I, I, I Stopped a lot, other, a lot of other activities that, that I really enjoyed, but the pain just persisted. It was clear to me that there was something unusual going on. There was a switch that had gotten thrown um, and it wasn't going back. You know, nothing was turning off the switch. It wasn't just reverting back to the previous relatively pain-free state that I was in be, uh, before. Um, so I, uh, I moved out to California to, to start a postdoc in uh, 2008. And um, a lot of my training before had been in uh, understanding how the brain controls movement. And that's initially what I'd done my, my postdoc in. Um, but as I started to go through pelvic pain treatments, go to pelvic floor physical therapy, um, I recognized that there was this uh, kind of overlap between movement control and how the, the brain controls muscles, which is what my expertise was in. And... Um, and chronic pain. And so a couple years later, when I was fortunate to be able to start my own lab in the, uh, in physical therapy at, at USC, um, I was pretty passionate that I was going to uh, study that. I wanted re I was re obviously really passionate uh, about studying, studying pain. Um, and so I think what happened uh, next was that um, I recognized that it was an important thing to be able to understand what was going on in the brain in patients with chronic pain. I didn't actually have a lot of background in neuroimaging research per se, but I was passionate about learning it and making an impact. Um, and so I, I started doing imaging research. And this was around the same time that the MAP study uh, got going. Um, and so MAP was an NIH funded effort to understand um, chronic pelvic pain syndromes. Um, it was largely inspired by the fact that there had been a, a, a lot of um, either not successful or marginally successful clinical trials that had taken place uh, in the aughts. Uh, and it was kind of a recognition by the NIH that it was important to take a step back and try to look at some of the fundamental biology that might be going on in these conditions to inspire new clinical trials or different approaches. Um, and so I um, was able to start working on the neuroimaging study uh, in MAP. And uh, what I was able to bring to the scientific study was this recognition that the pelvic floor seemed to be an important thing that was involved in a lot of these conditions. And I came to the people in the, in the MAP network that had just gotten going, and I said, 
why don't we study the parts of the brain that control pelvic floor muscles? Um, there might be some really interesting things going on there. Uh, let's have a look. And sure enough, when we started looking there, um, there were all sorts of unusual changes, things that couldn't easily be explained. Uh, and especially when you looked across the whole brain, there seemed to be this hot spot in the area that controls the pelvic floor of not only structural differences, um, but also functional differences in, in how the brain was, was performing. Can you real quick just explain a little bit about what neuroimaging is? Yeah, yeah. Um, so neuroimaging is a field of neuroscience um, that is, I would say, primarily focused on how do you use MRI or magnetic resonance imaging to study the brain. Uh, and it can come in a variety of forms. It can be structural. So you can take a really high definition picture of the brain and then study its folds and study its thickness and study its intensity and, and just kind of these structural features about the brain. Or you can also uh, utilize what's called the bold signal or blood oxygen level dependent signal. Uh, and what the bold signal, the information that that's carrying is how active are different regions of the brain. Um, and you can also deduce how synchronously active two different regions of the brain is. And that's often called functional connectivity. How much are two brain regions communicating with one another? And then in the clinical realm, you can then start to recruit patients and recruit uh, controls and um, start to make comparisons and learn where are there differences between uh, groups and how do those relate to the, to the clinical presentation and the clinical symptoms. Awesome. Thank you. So in my lab through the my 2010s, I was fortunate to have a series of students and we did like a lot of studies to really work out how does the brain control pelvic floor muscles? How does it control the bladder? How do, does it uh, store? Uh, how does it regulate urine storage um, and, and voiding? All driven by the fact that I knew that the MAP study, um, based on the work that I had done, was really showing these strong differences uh, in those areas. And so we worked out a lot of really uh, interesting basic science facts about how the brain controls pelvic floor muscles. Um, and we also uh, made a lot of success uh, starting to stimulate those areas with non-invasive brain stimulation, um, which some of your listeners will be uh, familiar with in terms of uh, TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, so it's a technique that's been uh, largely developed uh, through the uh, psychiatric um, area of, of being able to treat uh, depression. But it's a, it's a general technique that you can use to stimulate areas of the brain that are close to the surface of the skull. It uses magnetic energy to pass through the skull and uh, activate the, the neurons um, that are beneath the area that is stimulated. So throughout the 2010s, we were using it as more of a scientific tool to uh, probe how different brain areas were connected to the pelvic floor, how would they regulate pelvic floor activity. That together with MAP grew into a, a clinical trial that I'm running now, uh, which is the first clinical trial that was inspired by findings of the MAP research network. Uh, and the idea basically was to say that we know from MAP how brain function appears to be different in patients with pelvic pain compared to uh, individuals without pelvic pain. How can we use TMS to nudge that brain activity closer to that of a person without pain? And can that uh, improve brain activity? Can it improve pelvic floor muscle function? And can it ultimately reduce pain as well? Um, and so that's a clinical trial that we are uh, we're excited about and we're, we've been uh, running for the last uh, couple of years. Yeah, so that's kind of the arc of, of how I got interested in this and um, where it kind of currently is. So fantastic. So just to summarize, you identified the regions of the brain that control pelvic floor muscle function. I also know during some of the studies that you did with MAP that you identified that there are differences in how some of these regions of the brain talk to each other in patients who may be considered a non-responder to mm -hmm. things like physical therapy. And this is the missing piece, I think, in clinical practice where over the years, you and I have had many discussions about what you're finding in research, and I could identify clinical manifestations of the same thing. 
So as we start to talk about this, what you then led into is the chronic overlapping pain conditions. Right. And so we don't want our patients to think they have 17 different diagnoses when if there's a difference in what you've identified in their brains, they may be functioning differently than someone else and they're experiencing pain. Right. And so we're hoping you can shed a little bit light on that as you start to get into the chronic yeah. overlap. No, absolutely. And so once we found these initial things about uh, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, we kind of recognized that a lot of the physicians and other researchers in MAP um, were studying a lot of the clinical presentation data. And it seemed that the most important factor in clinical presentation was how widespread uh, pain was uh, across the body. Um, they, uh, patients that had very widespread pain tended to have different symptom trajectories. They tended to not do as well, uh, and they tended to have a lot of other, uh, comorbidities. Um, and so with Rick Harris at the university of Michigan, I've started to lead an effort to understand what was patterns of brain activity might distinguish a, um, a person that had very localized pelvic pain. Uh, from a person that had very widespread um, pain across their body in addition to pelvic pain. Uh, and that, that widespread body pain corresponded nicely to either clinical diagnoses or um, kind of questionnaire criteria for chronic overlapping pain conditions. Um, and what we found was, was really fascinating um, that there was a in a region that was very, a brain region that was very close to this area that controls the pelvic floor, not exactly the same region, but ex extremely close. Um, that region was tightly connected to the pain network, which is a kind of distributed set of regions that people have associated with the presence of not only acute pain, but also chronic pain. That pain network was sort of like grabbed onto this region of sensory motor cortex in the patients with widespread pain, uh, and it was much more tightly um, connected in, in those patients. So that was a cool finding. We got a very uh, nice paper out of it, but then it, it sat for a couple of years, um, and we didn't know what to do with it, actually, because it surprised us. Um, some of your listeners might be aware of the homunculus. Um, so the homunculus is this strip of your motor cortex and sensory cortex that runs all the way from the very top of your brain all the way down to the sides. And there's an orderly representation of different parts of your body as you move uh, or as you go from point to point to point. So it starts with more of the uh, core body regions like your trunk, then it moves to your kind of shoulder, then it moves to your hand. Then it moves to your mouth and um, and so forth. Uh, and this is uh, this was originally discovered by a famous neurosurgeon, uh, Wilder Penfield, who was also a, a Princeton graduate. So I always always liked this was back in the 40s and 50s when he discovered it, but I always uh, had a great fondness for that work. Um, that being said, what we expected in that patients that had widespread body pain would that they would have very widespread changes in sensory motor cortex. And that's not at all what we found. We found basically one little spot that was different in the patients um, uh, with widespread body pain compared to those that, that didn't. And so fast forward even a little bit more, I think that's why it was, it was sitting for a little while. But in 2020, 2021, uh, a colleague of Rick Harris at the University of Michigan, uh, Chelsea Kaplan, was uh, investigating um, adolescents who were developing pain. And uh, she was particularly interested in adolescents that develop, start to develop widespread body pain you know, uh, kids that are 10, 11, 12, 13, um, quite a number, and we'll just start to, you know, describe abdominal discomfort, um, or they might have uh, pain as associated with the menstrual cycle, or they might start to have wide, you know, even more widespread body pain, aches and pains in the limbs. Um, and so what she did in this other large NIH funded study called ABCD um, was to uh, look at brain scans from kids. Um, and then after the brain scan was done, this, uh, the kids had their symptoms and pain tracked 
for uh, up to 18 months and, and some some cases even longer. And so she identified kids that went that developed widespread body pain and then she identified kids that did not and then went back to those brain scans and looked at the difference between the two. Uh, and sure enough, the key difference was how the pain network was grabbing on to this one little spot in uh, in the sensory motor cortex, uh, exactly like what we found in the adults with, with pelvic pain. Go ahead. Which is really interesting because this is research she's doing and this is research you're doing. And it was very similar in different populations. Different populations, exactly. And so then you could imagine that we started to get a little, uh, even more excited about what this mm-hmm. could mean because, you know, I am fascinated by chronic pain across the, the lifespan. Um, and I'm also fascinated by the fact that when you ask the patients with interstitial cystitis in the MAP study, when did your symptoms start? You get this just like enormous peak in the teens and early 20s. And then mm-hmm. the actual, the, the frequency at which people are reporting the onset of pain drops pretty precipitously, actually. Um, you know, in the 30s and 40s, it becomes, you know, a little bit less likely. There's a little, another little bump later in the 40s and 50s, um, which may represent a different mechanism. But the bulk of the patients are basically saying, I've had this pain for a long time and it dates back into my adolescence. And that's, you know, really exciting because I think the earlier that we can understand where these pain conditions are coming from, the earlier we could potentially uh, intervene and hopefully ultimately be able to prevent the emergence of some of these very complex overlapping um, pain syndromes. I think that's what you are doing. I mean, and again, it it matches what we see in the clinic. Two different research studies are showing something, but you said something really important, I think, for our listeners, which is one little spot. I think people, when they're suffering from various conditions. And again, if they went to the urologist, it's being called IC. If they went to a gynecologist when they're 13, it would have been dysmenorrhea. Here's the birth control pill. But the one little spot in the brain is a phenotype. And that's what I think some of this research is identifying. I mean, we know it is, is there's different types of reason, different phenotypes for why people have the symptoms that they do. And historically, it used to be end organ and peripheral. Mm -hmm. But now you have brought in a bigger understanding and so we were hoping you could talk about that. Yeah. And I think that's where you were going next is because one little spot is not as drastic as their symptoms may feel. There, Oh, there's absolutely hope. And we'll, we'll definitely get into that. Um, but to sort of complete the scientific arc, there was a very major paper published this year in the journal Nature, which is one of the preeminent scientific journals that was um, reimagining Penfield's homunculus. And kind of questioning whether or not it what that the how the body is represented in the brain actually followed this pattern that he uh, described uh, so many decades ago, and um, what it turns out is that there are in fact these uh, interspersed regions along this map that you know the, the 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 map represents your your limbs and your your face and these other like kind of the whole body but interspersed among that map are these little regions that represent the whole body and there are three or four of those um the the original paper paper published that there are three i think that there are four but regardless there uh, are these small regions that represent the whole body that are kind of living inside this um uh bigger map. It'd be almost like you had a map of the world and you were looking at the the map of the world. And then like in a couple little spots, if you looked closely enough, you would see a map of the universe that was embedded in the map of the world. Um, And so, of course, one of these maps of the whole body overlaps really closely with where we're finding the changes in adults with widespread pain and also where the adolescents are starting to are showing um, differences in in their brain function even before they're starting to report pain, um, and so I think that it's that pro- maybe explains why it's the the little spot. We don't know exactly yet all of the connections that that little spot makes. How is it connected to the autonomic nervous system, for example? Um, how is it uh, connected to the rest of the brain? But it probably plays a big role 
for lots of bodily functions because it's probably integrating a lot of information, not only about the specific region of the body that um, you know might be in pain, but you know a, a lot of information about uh, the body as a whole. Um, and so, yeah, we're really excited about that finding because it could potentially help us to interpret what what we're seeing. Yeah, that is incredible. I have a clarifying question, and it's something that you said when you presented to our staff meeting, I don't know, like last last year at some point. Mm -hmm. So that network that you're seeing the brain kind of grasp onto in people with more widespread pain, This is this the area that you had talked about that everybody has those connections? It's just more prominent in those with the chronic overlapping pain? conditions is that was that correct that's correct yeah um that was um <laughs> in fact we the, the paper that i described in nature did a very thorough analysis but uh what i talked about at your the publication of ours that i talked about at your staff meeting i think was a kind of we were seeing a glimpse of the same phenomenon pretty early on uh, and what essentially we did was we took the pain network and then we looked at how does that connect to lots of different regions across the sensory motor strip. And we found these like special little nodes. And we did that work in completely healthy and re replicated and validated it in uh, patients that were individuals that we could verify were not reporting any body pain. Um, so yes, and the way that I interpret it uh, is that it's just, it represents these fundamental connections that uh, all of us have part, potential body regions that are uh, more prone to threat. Um, but now I'm starting to rethink that a little bit because um, now with, with their findings and their interpretation, it might mean something a little bit different. So I don't know exactly how to interpret what these regions mean, but what you're saying is correct. They, are, they exist in even healthy individuals. And then this, inter, this heightened interconnectivity in, is happening in uh, individuals with widespread body pain. Yeah, that uh, it'll be interesting to see what where that goes and the meaning of them once we have more information. But I, I think it uh, fundamentally it tells us that pain is a protective mechanism essentially, and where the although we can't see the map of the body where these chronic overlapping pain syndromes are, it's really interesting when you showed us how it's sort of protecting the torso. You know, we think about the pelvis with pelvic pain, IC, endometriosis, IBS, low back pain, and then we kind of move upwards into TMJ, migraines, things like that. And I, I think that was fascinating, at least the example of the interpretation of your data mm -hmm. in that it, it sort of serves as you'll, I think you mentioned, you'll cut off a limb to, to survive. But, you know, those are areas that are very protective and we need to survive. So yeah. I always thought about that after that, that uh, lecture. No, and I continue to think about that too. But that's one of the exciting things about science is that you, you, you have a model for how it works in your head. And then some new piece of data comes along and you have to scratch your head and say, is that really what it is that really what I was seeing? Is that really what it means? And it's the great, like, humbling thing of science is that we're always learning uh, new stuff and, and reevaluating uh, what we think we know. And so you started with the identification, and then you started to allude to treatment mm -hmm. as well, and the TMS, and that, I think, also goes into the SURF study. It does. Yeah, with uh, the, the kind of the arc on the on the TMS piece. Oh, ho, there it is. Project Stoke. Yeah, yeah. I'll get into that in, in one moment. <laughs> I just wanted to say briefly that, yeah, we in a, a, a small number, we did a preliminary study in a small number of, uh, of people and just de demonstrated proof of principle that it, we could this region that was associated with chronic overlapping pain conditions, we could stimulate it and sort of disconnect it from the pain network or reduce its connection to the pain network, driving things a little bit back more to uh, the quote unquote pain-free state. So uh, we're excited about the clinical trial that we're doing for TMS because we might be able to hit the pelvic floor regions and this chronic overlapping pain region in one shot. Uh, whether or not it will, it will improve both types of, of symptoms, you know, the more pelvic floor specific versus the more widespread pain, we don't know yet. Um, but we're excited that these regions might be close enough that we can treat them both by the same stimulation uh, paradigm. It's phenomenal. 
Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about endo and how this is really, this may be really impactful for endometriosis too, because we know that surgery and excision surgery in particular can take care of the lesion, but the delay is seven to 10 years and many times even longer than that. And just like you mentioned with the spike of people reporting, you know, when symptoms started with IC or urologic pain, it's the same for endometriosis. And I think that's why there's so many parallels between IC and endometriosis as well. And the connection can be the central nervous system and the brain for a lot of cases. And we know in clinical practice, we see this all the time, you have a great surgery, but it doesn't take away all the pain generators. And the patients, I think, that are educated about that before going into surgery or do some of the work to cross the things off the list that can take care of it, do a lot better because they understand that this journey hasn't ended after surgery, Mm -hmm. though a main piece of it has been taken care of. But the ones that go into surgery, even with the best surgeon, may still have these problems lingering. And then it's, did something get missed? Is my endo back? Why is this persisting? And I think that having other options that are not hormonally focused on just shutting down hormones is going to be really important. Because even as PTs, there's a limitation into how much we can do when it's not just muscular, right? And so there's medications we can, we can, talk about, but I think something like TMS or these other interventions could be really useful for a significant number of people with endo. Yeah. And I'm really excited about the possibility of TMS being able to help patients um, better manage symptom Um, Mm flare-ups. And I know that's a big thing in in, uh, IC. And um, I think that uh, I have a, a Fulbright scholar from Australia who's coming to my do some work in my lab in the in the spring, um, and he's done some really nice work in um, acute pain uh, provocation, where uh, an acute pain stimulus is provided to an otherwise healthy individual, um, and then either a fake or quote unquote sham TMS is provided to the motor, to the brain or um, active TMS is given to the brain. And the active group can actually reduce the intensity of the flare-up that comes from the acute pain provocation, and he can reduce its duration. So it's sort of not as intense and doesn't last as long. And so I'm hopeful that, um, I know that my own uh, pelvic pain historically is very uh, episodic. I know that some people have more kind of constant pain, but a large percentage of the of the IC and pelvic pain population anyway has uh, a big component of flare-ups to their symptoms. And so I'm hopeful that eventually one day um, a person may be able to come for a brief duration of TMS treatment when they know that they're going into a flare-up and we can knock the flare-up out before it even starts um, and kind of help people stay at more of a uh, manageable, functional uh, uh, baseline with their symptoms. I am sure that's great news for everyone listening that it has pain. So to summarize, the TMS is something just in my general observation, talking to friends, talking to patients, a lot of people don't know what that is. And so for the listeners, it is something that has been proven to help refractory anxiety and depression. And what we're saying during this podcast is pain is not that different than those things. We're not saying it's a psychiatric comorbidity, but the TMS is one way to target the brain, just like some of the neuromodulation medications have been too, which is very different than what Jandra just said about hormonal management of endometriosis. So if we can really round out this picture and take the pain that people with endometriosis have as something separate than their endometriosis, people are going to be functioning at a higher level. And I do think the research that you're doing in TMS, it worked for anxiety and depression. It is going to work for pain too. It's just not yet clinically accessible to many people. Right. And one other thing I want to emphasize to your listeners uh, along the lines of not thinking of pain as a, a psychological problem there's a neuroscience foundation to that, which is that uh, the most effective um, TMS uh, stimulation for depression is very different from the best stimulation for pain. So if you want to reduce depression symptoms, it's better to stimulate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, primarily on the left side of the brain. 
if you want to reduce pain symptoms, that is actually not the best target. The best target is motor cortex um, and, uh, and what we're stimulating in the study. So even that tells you something that they're kind of like, that they're different. Pain in the brain and you know, anxiety and depression in the brain, both very impactful, but distinct things. Um, and I think that, you know, tuning, finding a TMS stimulation approaches that can work for different symptom types and, um, and di even different subtypes of pain uh, will ultimately um, uh, be a much better approach. So what I hear you saying, and I think a lot of people will be able to uh, kind of identify with this, is when you're, you know, in the urgent care, the ER, and you're talking about your pain and the doctor says, so, do you think that this might be anxiety? We can respond and say, actually, they're two different parts of the brain. <laughs> I think that's a perfectly appropriate response, yes. <laughs> and, to, and to give them your paper. <laughs> and sometimes, like, the people who have widespread pain versus those who don't, I look at it as having blue versus brown eyes. You know, so what you're really saying is there's these biological things in the brain, and it is as different as, you know, our hair color or our eye color. So people just need to know that it isn't something they did to themselves, right. but the medical system is just now getting caught up in our circle. So it's still going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, no, absolutely. So while the TMS is under construction, <laughs> you're doing it a different way with physiological movement and surfing. I am. I am. So um, the history here is that uh, it was uh, things... My symptoms were improving over the years when I was a, a junior faculty member, uh, kind of in the early 2010s. Um, but I was still having a lot of flare-ups and still having a lot of, uh, of issues. And I was getting through, but it was still very challenging. And more just on the, you know, take something off, take something off the bucket list, I decided to, to learn how to, to, to surf. And fortunate to be here in Los Angeles and... and uh, have access to be able to do that. And I, it was just very peculiar because I noticed that at first that, you know, after I would get out of a surfing session, um, I just wouldn't have any pain at all. And that was kind of peculiar. Um, then after a little while longer, I noticed that I was less likely to have pain even on days that I wasn't surfing, as long as I was surfing somewhat regularly, like maybe if I was going once a week, then it just seemed like on those weeks, it was much less likely that I was going to have symptoms, even if it was, even if I didn't surf on a particular day. And then I thought, okay, that, you know, that, that's interesting and everything, but everybody's got their thing. Okay, fortunately, I have my thing that I can do to manage the pain, but there's nothing scientifically interesting to study here. Everybody's, you know, got their own, own thing that they can do. Um, but last year I saw a uh, documentary on Netflix that I would highly recommend called Resurface, uh, which is the, the story of um, surfing, surf therapy being used for uh, veterans with PTSD. And uh, the way that they described their experience just resonated a lot with me. And it was became clear that, that other people were, were interested in this. And then it was pretty easy to conceptualize what was going on. Um, I think that the, one of the unique aspects of surfing is that it is a physical activity in a extremely dynamic environment. Um, and so everything around you is moving, the waves are crashing, there are other people in the water, there's just a lot of stuff going on and your brain only has so much bandwidth. And um, it, it is harder to think about pain and other threats that might be going on in your body when there is such an enormous number of, of um, uh, things going on in the, in the outside world that you have to pay attention to. Uh, and so um, I've approached, uh, there was a, a mechanism to form a multidisciplinary collaboration at USC. Um, to improve health uh, outcomes, but by you know making interesting links, and so I, I partnered with some uh, folks in in engineering and used my neuroscience uh, background and really wanted to actually study this. So um, we are in the process of just finishing up the first. They they funded the study. We were very fortunate. It I think it was interesting because I always had this fear that that people were going to look at it as sort of like 
oh, that's that's interesting, but it's pretty niche. Like, could that really actually work for 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 pain, or or even worse, like, oh, you like surfing, you just want to surf, and you want to get, get some money to to do that. Uh, but actually, I got exactly the opposite response. Um, when I got funded and the story went out, I got emails from administrators <laughs> uh, at the University uh, of Southern California saying like, oh, this is an amazing study. And I totally agree with you. Uh, this is the thing that is really helpful to me and, you know, managing my life and my symptoms that I, that I deal with. And I think it just resonated with, with people that um, they kind of understood what potentially could go, be going on. And plus, surfing just fundamentally has this kind of very joyful um, aspect to it, which I think resonates with a lot of people. You're also in Southern California, so that's probably helpful. <laughs> it's also, yeah, that's right. This is probably not, not a study that might be able to, to immediately happen elsewhere. But um, we are, you know, we are having what I think is unique about this study is that we're approaching it with an eye to therapeutics uh, very early on, meaning we really want to understand how uh, this activity could reduce symptoms, how it could improve brain function, uh, but as simultaneously, how can we design it in a patient-centered way? Um, and how could we expand access to it? So the collaboration with engineering is to create uh, a really state-of-the-art virtual reality um, surfing simulator that involves a movable board, fully immersive VR, um, so that you know you don't have to necessarily be at the, the at the beach. We are um, designing this in close collaboration with the patients that are in our study, which I think is very important. That we're not going to like create this thing that's great surfing simulator, but you know it doesn't really resonate with the with the patients. So um, the, our first group of patients has just gone through three out of four of their uh, weekly visits, and um, after they're finished that, they're going to come to the lab and give us feedback about how does the VR compare to the real world? Uh, is it comfortable? Is it enjoyable to use? Um, can you imagine that it might have the same kind of impact on your symptoms that the, uh, the, that the real ocean is having and really design it in a principled patient-centered way? Which will help get around the fact for the people who need it that don't live in Los Angeles and can't go surfing themselves. One other thing about that, though, is I was out on the East Coast uh, and there is a uh, indoor wave pool at uh, the um, American Dream Place in the Meadowlands. Um, and I really enjoyed surfing there. And I think it, it I was approaching it very scientifically and I wanted to say, well, could a wave pool have the same therapeutic benefit? Let's see. And sure enough, it seemed to be very, uh, even being in that environment was very effective. So I think through some combination of VR, wave pool, and the real ocean, we might be able to weave together a, a very immersive experience. And I don't want, I don't want the listeners to take away that like there's, you know, I think there's something special about surfing, but there isn't something magical about surfing. Like we're keying into a, an immersive activity that can be helpful for pain. And it's probably only one of many immersive activities that can be help, very helpful for pain. I think there are non-immersive activities. There are things that probably are physical activities that won't help so much with pain. And so we want to kind of identify which ones do really help with pain. Um, but that, that probably is not only surfing. Now, when I asked you about what it was about surfing specifically, you didn't say it was surfing. When we talked, I think when you were at our staff meeting, it was more about, you said something along the lines of intense focus. You had a more sophisticated way, uh, an intense focus on an out. Yeah, external Go focus ahead. of attention. Yes, the, intense. A external. External yes. focus of attention, but it, that is, like a lot of activities have an external focus of attention. Um, and, but depending on how dynamic and, in, and intense the external environment is, some activities are better than others at eliciting that uh, redirection of, intention, uh, of attention from internal to external. It makes me think, too, of maybe slight differences of a wave pool, because when you go surfing, you, currents, tides people out there, right? The environment is different every single time. And that's kind of the frustrating, but also nice thing about surfing is it's not that predictable. 
to some extent. You can go in the same spot every single day and have a different experience, which makes it fun and sometimes frustrating. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And that's something we can do in, in VR um, and that's a little harder to do in the wave pool. Um, but I think we'll, we'll just have to investigate it because I think that there can still be something very um, fun about like getting on an artificial wave and splashing and all of the other things, the movement of the board, all of those other kind of things that are happening, even that is slightly unpredictable, right? That's what makes it so hard to surf. You're doing something that is a fundamental, un fundamentally unstable activity. Like only when the board is has forward velocity does it gain any stability whatsoever. And even then, it's not very much stability. So even the smallest move can create a very different outcome. And I think that makes it, makes it very interesting and engaging. And at least the wave pool can recapture a piece of that. Especially when you start to go left. Uh, <laughs> no, there's only wrong, and uh, there's only the right way to surf a wave and the wrong way. There's no left. <laughs> and to speak to the virtual reality, uh, Jandra put an Oculus on me a year ago or so and I am terrified of heights and whatever you had me on was like walking the a plank, plank challenge and I was like on the ground in, in two seconds it was a very real experience for me and I was shaking and if anyone had it was, she was in the corner hiding like on the ground like. and that was my one and only time <laughs> yeah. using that thing and I will never do it again but I think it's powerful just to you know credit credit the virtual reality situation never again <laughs> It is a very, it can be a very powerful stimulus. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else that you want to, I mean, this was incredible. Anything else you want to share about pain, surfing, encouragement? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I put out a, a, a tweet a couple of a week or so ago um, that I was very heartened by the response to. I, I wanted to make sure that the patient community um, uh, knew that their experience resonated with me and it was a very uh, key part of my research was was thinking about their experience. Um, and I actually posted a picture of myself in 2008 on a, a, what I can recall as the worst day of pain that I ever, ever had. Uh, and it's a picture of me smiling. Um, and so it was sort of a reminder to folks that you know, you can smile your way through pain, but that doesn't mean that the pain isn't isn't real. Um, that I study the brain, but that doesn't mean that I think that pain is in the head. Um, and just kind of a, a, a reminder to that we all have to be like compassionate to one another and, and understand that there are, you know, people going through very significant pain experiences and, um, and sometimes they're hiding or, you know, not able to really be... Um, out front about the, the pain they're having. So I'm, I feel fortunate that I've been able to have a role in the scientific community where I can use my own pain experience in a, um, in an open way to end in a way that motivates my own research that, and helps me think about uh, new and important uh, experiments to do new potential treatments to design. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, yeah, I just want the, the listeners and the patients to know that what they're going through really resonates with me. And I'm very hopeful about the future, about how we can use things like brain stimulation and immersive activity to kind of bring people back to health. Like a lot of people will gradually improve from, from chronic pain, but it can take a really long time. And we want to be able to accelerate that process and people shouldn't have to spend years and, and decades uh, in pain. And I hope I can play a role in uh and helping to, to end that. I can say for sure you did. And we thank you so much for your research. You dedicated your career to this and it is phenomenal what you've done, what you've accomplished. Well, thank you so and much I for all the work you have done. It's been very impressive. Yes, you both are incredible mentors and practitioners, researchers. So I'm, I feel so lucky. I, Think about this sometimes, Jason. When I applied to PT school, I almost went to USC. And sometimes I'm like, man, if I went, like you would have been one of my professors. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for saying what you did, for coming on the show and talking about yeah. your research. I think what you said is going to resonate really well with people with endometriosis. It's often termed an invisible disease, yeah. um, but it's yeah. very real. So right. 
Thank you for sharing that. Thank you both. Really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged, presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, icarebetter.com, or social media platforms, at icarebetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Thank you.